Hey everybody, Rob Mauer here. Welcome back to Tesla Daily. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Electrified. It's your host, Dylan Loomis. Quick shout out to my newest patrons, Gortalia and Reed M. Thank you for choosing to support the channel. With Rob off again today, I thought I'd at least give you his intro and thought it made sense for me to upload a little bit later. It gave me time to watch a lot of content. We actually got multiple new Sandy Monroe interviews. First one up from Autoline. Sandy is continually reiterating he believes the Chinese are coming. Now, it's anyone's guess if those vehicles will be allowed in the United States on a bigger scale due to political issues. However, this chart was shared by Sandy. It's his North American top 10. He's expecting Chinese automakers to make up 26% of the market it, followed by Tesla at 20%, and then Ford and Toyota were both at 8 They also went over this chart comparing a 2020 Tesla Model Y to a 2021 Ford Mach-E. So just remember, two years in Tesla time is a very long time, so these costs have presumably changed at least a little bit. At this time, also, we know that the Ford Mach-E is not profitable, and they did not give any detail on which variants they were talking about for this chart. And most importantly, Sandy has been pleasantly surprised with the 4680. We have maybe have underestimated the uh, the price of this battery, or maybe overestimated is the right word. This is coming out uh, less expensive than what we thought. So but that's what cheaper that's to make a jelly rig. This is the brand new one that we just took out of the uh, the Model Y that we have. This is less expensive, a lot less expensive than we thought. Um, it's got a lot more power than we thought. Uh, the, uh, the, the, the power out of that thing is a lot more than what we had anticipated. And the weight is about where we said, but the canisters are thinner than we thought. So, um, the canister is thinner, which means that the battery has more um, of the chemicals and the, uh, and the componentry, uh, to, to put this thing together and, uh, and, and generate electricity. Sandy's next interview was on the Bearded Tesla Guy YouTube channel. As always, video will be linked below. My main takeaways, Sandy is definitely anti-pouch and prismatic cell format. Now, of course, some major automakers are pursuing this and there will be a place in the market. But if Sandy were starting his own company, he would definitely prefer the cylindrical cell and said, quote, would never dream of going another direction. Sandy also mentioned how he thinks other companies should be working with Tesla and not fighting against them. This right here is such a crucial point. I mean, think about it. If some of these other leaders of automakers could just put their pride aside and reach out to Elon and maybe ask for some advice and some guidance, maybe some things to focus on or to really get started with this transition to EVs. I genuinely believe Elon would be open to offering some tips and advice. Not like he's going to give away trade secrets, but if he's about his mission, which he is, he'd be happy to kind of help these other automakers on where to focus. And I could be wrong, but it just seems like no one's actually doing this. They also talked about the culture at Legacy Auto and how sometimes management is actually incentivized to not innovate. They're just focusing on keeping the risk low, keeping the cost down, because innovating requires spending money and taking risks and all of that. So this is basically the antithesis of what Tesla is all about with innovation. So it's just going to be very hard for Legacy Auto to overcome this ingrained culture that's been there for decades. Every time I hear one of these things, oh, well, you can't read, you can't uh, recycle batteries oh come on is this guy an engineer if he is is he a practicing engineer or is he one of these guys who managed to get through and then oh, I found my M my way in the MBA no these guys are fools and I don't suffer fools they are just they're talking through their tail it's all baloney and that's that and if we could possibly um, talk Elon Musk into allowing us to use his chargers with all cars, game over, exactly, game over. Speaking of battery recycling, JB Straubel gave a keynote at Benchmark's Battery Gigafactories conference. He reminded us a closed loop EV ecosystem is coming and this does not and could never exist in the petroleum industry. Eventually, there will be no more mining and recycling is just very slept on at the moment. Now it's gonna take five, 10, 15 years for this to really ramp up. But as Elon always likes to say, recycling will be like directly mining high grade ore. So 
it's going to dramatically change the cost structure for electric vehicles and ultimately our reliance on other countries. Because we can't change the geology and where these raw materials are at, but once these products and battery packs come to North America, then we can keep them here with recycling. So Redwood doesn't actually build cells, it's building the components that then go into the cells. Right now, Redwood's focused on anode copper foil and cathode material. The cathode is the most expensive component in an electric vehicle cell. It makes up over half of the cost. And JV said many OEMs don't even understand what a cathode is yet. Looking at this chart, if you focus on the top left nickel, the green bars are the battery nickel demand out to 2030, and the gray bars are the expected supply. Remember, exclusive interview dropping this Sunday, we'll be talking about exactly this. This was an awesome chart that he shared that may be worth taking a screenshot of. As you can see, they're focused on that copper foil, which makes up part of the anode, and the cathode, which once again is over 50% of the cell cost. Redwood is also looking to scale. They're targeting 100 gigawatt hours by 2025 of cell material, focused on high nickel NMC and NCA content. But this is still only enough for around 1 million EVs. In the sit down portion with Simon Moores, JB said that they recently partnered with Toyota and they'll be recycling their big hybrid fleet of batteries, actually taking nickel from that fleet and repurposing it for new lithium ion batteries. Full video will be linked below. Monroe Live also dropped another video on the 4680 pack. They talked about this plastic holder right here that's kind of for the mica on the bottom of the 4680 cells. The main takeaway though was just how structural and how rigid this pink polyurethane substance actually is. And maybe most importantly, they pointed out there are 69 cells in each bandolier. The Inflation Reduction Act is currently being debated and should be voted on today. Once again, most expecting it to pass. I just think it's so odd that no one really has any idea what vehicles are actually going to qualify. You would think that when they make these bills, they would talk to the automakers and figure things out to make sure you know it all is going to make sense in actuality. But the Alliance for Automotive Innovation is saying that they're estimating 70% of the 72 current EVs and plugins on the US market would no longer be eligible for these credits. So it'll be very interesting to see what's eligible. Teslamag.de got some documents and they're now confirming this new Model Y coming out of Giga Berlin. They're saying it'll have a 55 kilowatt hour battery, good for 440 kilometers or 273 miles of range. They're also saying it will have a structural pack. So is this going to be with the BYD blade cells in Tesla structural pack, or is it going to be a structural pack completely from BYD? Don't know for sure right now. Here's a chart from Cox Automotive, pure BEV sales in the first half of 2022 in the United States. I just wanna point out that four of the top six vehicles are Tesla models, the Y, the 3, the S, and the X. Also, the Ionic is spelled I-O-N-I-Q. We talked about the Tesla energy overhaul coming this year yesterday. Well, now on the Megapack page, it's now up in size to 3.9 megawatt hours. If you go back just a few months, you'll see it was only 3.1 megawatt hours per Megapack. Tesla Adri pointed out there's a new self-diagnostics feature that has to do with your battery degradation. So now you can kind of self-assess what's going on with your battery pack. Brandon said he tried this feature and got a direct call from Tesla customer support. They reviewed the data and told him that his battery is currently about 82.5% when it comes to retention after about four years and 80,000 miles of driving. I would love for there to be a massive repository of the battery retention figures for all Teslas at different timelines to see how the health is holding up. There are some charts, but most of the data is pretty anecdotal. But of course, as the fleet grows, hopefully we'll get more information like this. As always, these numbers should not be any sort of expectation. This is just one example. Whole Mars uploaded this video. Now he did narrate it. I just wanna show you the initial part of this. Some of these maneuvers early on in this clip are actually really impressive. The main point here is I fully agree with his thesis that once this is released to a wider audience, maybe all of North America this year, so many people are going to have their socks blown off. Now, is it perfect? Absolutely not. Do you always need to be in control? Absolutely. However, despite all of the attacks and the shortcomings, it's still pulling off some really impressive maneuvers. Speaking of autonomy, Mobileye just did a transcontinental trip with its supervision system, and they said it went very well. I haven't yet been able to find a video of the trip. To showcase the adaptability of the system, they let their guests choose waypoints along the route. And remember, they are working on a computer vision system alone that performed a 
significant part of this drive in mapless mode. Remember, Tesla actually worked with Mobileye in the early days of Tesla's autopilot. Now, Mobileye has agreements with six different automakers, including BMW, Nissan, and VW. This was part of the reason that Tesla cut ties with Mobileye because it had to focus on other OEMs too. Elon said Mobileye's ability to evolve its tech is unfortunately negatively impacted by having to support hundreds of models from legacy auto companies, resulting in a very high engineering drag coefficient. That said, just a reminder about Mobileye, I don't think they get nearly enough attention. I listened to Rivian's Q2 earnings call and here are the takeaways. They're currently focused on ramping their normal facility to 150,000 capacity. They're adding a second shift for general assembly toward the end of quarter three. And right now they have 98,000 pre-orders for R1 vehicles for the United States and Canada only. And the pre-order rate has been increasing. RJ's confident about demand and pricing power as he's seeing strong preferences from consumers for their highest trim levels, which should help to offset the cost increases. He's excited about commercial opportunities with the Inflation Reduction Act and that potential $40,000 commercial EV credit and Rivian's Fleet OS software for fleet management. Every commercial electric delivery van or EDV sold to Amazon comes with Fleet OS that does generate recurring revenue for Rivian. Rivian produced and delivered over 4,400 vehicles in the quarter. This was up from 2,553 in quarter one. They had a net loss of $1.7 billion for the quarter. They have $15 billion in cash and they're expecting $2 billion in CapEx per year through 2025 to expand the plant in normal and for their new R2 lines in the new facility in Georgia. They did reaffirm their production guidance of 25,000 for this year. CATL is looking to build what I believe is the biggest battery factory in Europe, set for 100 gigawatt hours of capacity, which will cost around $7 billion. Construction of the first production facilities will start within this year. This new cell supply is going to be for Mercedes, BMW, Stellantis, and VW, and this plant will enable it to better cope with the battery demands of the European market. GM CATL CFO Paul Jacobson said they're hitting an inflection point and expecting to ramp EV production. I guess you could make anything an inflection point, but they said they're doubling their EV production target from 1 million to 2 million by 2025. These are the current EVs GM has available and upcoming they have the Chevy Silverado, the Blazer and the Equinox. GM is saying they've been increasing spending on the freight to get vehicles into consumers' hands. They're insisting that the demand is there, but the issue is getting the cars out. Rivian also said they're spending more money on expedite costs, much like Tesla has had to do in the past as well. This was a sad story. I'm just bringing it up because it was not GM employees. It was actually a cleaning crew working late night at a GM plant. Apparently two people got in a fight and one unfortunately killed the other. So short term, the bolt production will be shut down. This is a silver lining situation. It looks like Starlink was hacked. However, now they're going to basically hold a hackathon and give a bounty for people to find other vulnerabilities. So SpaceX is inviting security researchers to try to hack the system, offering up to $25,000 per discovered vulnerability. SpaceX said the attack was technically impressive and the first attack of its kind that they're aware of in the system. The SpaceX patch has been rolled out for Starlink dishes to make it harder to exploit. However, the flaws will persist in the existing hardware unless the main chip inside can be replaced. Good news, these flaws can only be exploited if the attacker has physical access to the Starlink Starlink dish, so a remote attack is not possible. Starlink satellites in orbit also cannot be attacked due to these vulnerabilities, nor can they expose other users' info or be exploited to tamper with other Starlink dishes over the network. Lucid Motors shared this quick teaser video saying state of the art to a higher state, coming to Monterey Car Week on August 19th. Some people are speculating because of that part of the video that this may be a tri-motor vehicle. Sawyer out here grinding as always, this time counting 8,800 Teslas spotted at Shanghai's Southport Terminal. This would be a record the previous high as far as we know was 7,000. So could be an indication that production at Giga Shanghai is indeed ramped up. Real quick, if you're at all interested in the semiconductor space or the political situation between the United States and China, definitely watch this video. 
I'll include a link below. It was awesome and very well done. In part of the video, he covered this research study. They actually simulated a game of these different countries and how this may play out over the next five to 10 years. So the research report will be linked below. I'd highly encourage you watch the video this weekend if you have the time, because remember Tesla, all EVs, phones, laptops, computer, basically all of our technology is reliant on the most advanced semiconductors that Taiwan has a monopoly over. So very interesting times that we live in. That'll do it for today. Please take a second to like the video if you did. Hope you guys have a wonderful day and a huge thank you to all of my Patreon supporters.